Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Bajaj Auto's conference call to discuss the third quarter fiscal year 2022 financial results. We have with us Mr. Rakesh Sharma, Executive Director, Mr. Kevin Disa, Officiating CFO, and Mr. Anand Newer, Divisional Manager, Investor Relations. My name is Stephen, and I will be your coordinator. As a reminder, all participant lines will be in the listen-only mode, and there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions after the presentation concludes. Should you need assistance during the conference call, please signal an operator by pressing star, then zero on your touchstone phone. Please note that this conference is being recorded. I now hand the conference over to the management for the opening remarks. Thank you and over to you. Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This is Rakesh Sharma here. Thank you very much for joining the call. I hope everyone is keeping safe and healthy, and I hope the third wave remains in our course and peters out very soon. So we announced our quarter three financial results last evening, but I hope by now you've had some opportunity to look into the details. Overall, Quarter three was yet again a difficult quarter to navigate due to the combination of an uncertain demand environment, even during the festive, cost increases and supply chain disruptions in semiconductors as well as uh, in shipping. However, overseas demand recovered quite smartly, held steady, and senior demand in India uh, also improved on the back of receding uh, lockdowns. So in this milieu, we tried to keep to our strategy of strengthening our competitive position by upgrading our propositions across and within segments, by capturing a greater share of the recovery in our leadership markets like overseas and three wheelers, and thereby improving upon our financial results quarter on quarter. I now move on to the business-wide comments. Let me start with our export business unit, which is now our largest business unit accounting for uh, over 56% of our top line. Quarter three was the highest quarter this year uh, in exports with average sales crossing 219,000 uh, per month. This was also supported by a high level of retails uh, in the market. In fact, quarter three retails is a record for us and it's the highest ever uh, quarterly retail achieved in all the uh, in overseas markets combined. Consequently, we have increased our global market share in both motorcycles and CV, and market shares were held or increased in every single region of the world. By end of quarter three, we have pushed through price increases of 5%. These are in retail terms. This is higher than what our competitors, uh, particularly competitors based out of India have done, and this performance, the record performance, both in shipping and retail, has been delivered while digesting the price increases at a retail level and navigating all the problems of uh, shipping as well as shortages in semiconductors. Uh, the outlook for uh, export business remains steady, and uh, stocks in most countries are in uh, tight control, and we hope to replicate this performance uh, in uh, quarter four as well. Uh, though, uh, because it's the financial year end, there is some spillover of business which occurs into the new financial year, so you might see some impact of that uh, towards the end of the of March. Coming to motorcycle business unit. The demand scenario continues to be muted as both billing and retail declined by double digits in Q3. Wahan data suggests registrations declined by 11% for motorcycles in Q3 at an industry level. Though the auspicious days have only just begun in January, but our retail data confirms that January continues to show a similar decline uh, in retails over January 21. All segments, entry, mid, and sports, are in decline. There may be a few percentage point difference uh, amongst them here and there, but largely they're all in decline. 
all geographies, rural, semi-urban are in similar decline. Cash sales are in decline, but a bit more than finance sales. Retail financing based sales have done slightly better. This all pervasiveness of decline suggests an underlying issue with both purchasing power and sentiment of the two-wheeler customer. You know, over 60% of our customers reside in socioeconomic classes of C, D, or P2, when, where, amongst other things, average incomes are less than Indian rupees 50,000 per month. And this segment of the demand pyramid is yet to see restoration of purchasing power or will to purchase. Against this backdrop, our decline was lower than the industry, resulting in a gain of market share on retail basis. Warm registrations again indicate an increase of 1.6 percentage points for us to a 20% YTD market share in FY22 compared to 18.4 in FY21. The rise in market share is driven by our upgrade strategy. In 100cc, our kickstart to electric start ratio has moved from being 25%, 75% in FY21 to about 95% in quarter three. That means 95% of our uh, portfolio, our sales in the 100cc is electric start. Our effort has been to upgrade, upgrade the kickstart customer into electric start. In the mid segment, which is the 125cc segment, 22% of our sales now comes from the premier Pulsar 125 NS. The 125 NS has been targeted at uh, uh, the youthful customer. It is 24% more expensive than the entry level Pulsar 125 drum. Today, Pulsar 125 NS, which was launched in April, it has established itself as the most aspirational 125cc bike. And like I said, 22% of our sales comes from this uh, variant. This is again another illustration of the upgrade strategy uh, playing out in the market. We are now going to extend the upgrade strategy in the sports segment too, which has not seen meaningful product introductions for quite some time now. As you know, a new 250cc platform was launched by us on October 28th, the 20th anniversary of the launch of Pulsar in India. Both the 250F and N have been very well received by experienced as well as amateur riders. A national rollout is unfolding in January, and we are seeing a 40% rate of increase in daily bookings every week, signaling a good level of adoption. We will be seeking to expand the new portfolio, and we'll be making uh, we'll be making new introductions at regular intervals over the next six to nine months completely refreshing and upgrading the Pulsar portfolio. The Dobina 400 upgrade has strengthened its position of a sports order and has been very well received by enthusiasts. While it doesn't add much in terms of volume, both internationally and domestic, however, uh, expanding this segment and gaining uh, share here and actually gaining customers here does a lot of uh, lot to the stature and to our franchise, both in India and overseas. It's a, uh, it is something which is uh, sort of surging ahead uh, in all markets now. Overall, due to the muted outlook of the industry and some uncertainty related to the third wave, we remain cautious about the environment uh, in Q4. We expect it to be negative over Q4 FY21. In this situation, our objective is to maintain our performance in Q4 compared to Q4 FY21. Uh, the three-wheeler business unit, the domestic three-wheeler business witnessed significant improvement as economic activities almost returned to normalcy in Q3. We sold more than 52,000 units during this quarter, which was 18% higher sequentially and 52% more than Q3 of last year. Consequently, we ended with a whopping market share of 71%. In fact, in December, it is 74%. The business unit is not just leading overall, but leading now in every single segment of the 
three-wheeler uh, market. Small passengers, large passengers, and cargo. In the cargo segment, we have crossed the market share of 50%. The rollout of the CNG network uh, continues to proceed strongly by the government. In this year, self-active CNG pumps and number of cities have increased by 50%. And this is this bodes very well for Bajaj Auto. Uh, uh, we have a market share of 75% in this segment. Uh, and this is also, uh, along with retail finance support, a key driver of uh, the expansion of market share in Q3. Going forward, our attempt will be to improve the quarter three level of performance. However, we have to monitor the impact of the third wave very closely. Currently, levels of inventory levels are very much in control, and if lockdowns do not disturb everyday traffic, we should be able to improve upon uh, our quarter three performance in Q4. On uh, electric vehicles, the urban business unit, urbanized business unit, we have applied for the champion OEM incentive scheme of auto PLI, under which we intend to invest over 1,000 crores in the next five years. This includes the early and first investment of 300 crores uh, in Akudi, which is right here in Pune, uh, which is expected to deliver us a production capacity of five lakh electric uh, two-wheelers per annum. The first vehicles are expected to roll out uh, by June uh, of this year. During this quarter, during the quarter three, I mean, we sold over 2,000 chetas and have an order book of uh, close to almost 10,000 vehicles. And this is basis a limited current footprint of being in eight cities. Now we are seeing a better visibility in supply chain, which will allow us to roll into 12 more cities this year and progressively in the nine month, next nine months or so, as the supply chain um, performance on EV components improves, and we are seeing that uh, happening, we are going to cover the entire country. We are gearing up in our dealership, Salesforce, et cetera, for this rollout based on the visibility in the supply chain. We are working towards expanding the EV portfolio to uh, cover different emerging seg segments, and we have a three-pronged approach to really building the EV business. The first is that despite all the frenzy which is surrounding this whole uh, subject, we are clear that we will prioritize certainty over speed to ensure we do not damage a nascent category and build a robust, dependable brand. Let me tell you as an aside, that when uh, the news of competitors was hitting the market uh, in uh, October, November or so, we did see some cancellations in uh, order bookings. However, with the passage of December and now in Jan, uh, when the performance of competition is uh, being witnessed and experienced by customers, our cancellations have dropped down to a trickle. So we are able to carry very large level of bookings at the most, uh, at the highest most prices for extended periods of time. And hence, we are convinced that the most important thing for us is to establish Pachaj and Chetak as a very dependable brand. The second part of our three-pronged approach is to continue to build R&D and supply chain capabilities for the longer term including through partnerships like with KTM or with the shared mobility investment we have in Judo. And the third piece in this approach is to expand our portfolio aggressively to cover different segments, standard and emerging, in India and select overseas markets through products which are designed and made to address specific use cases. This is what will leverage our R&D strength. We are not looking at importing designs and slapping together a power train so that we can speedily get into a market with a half complete product. We would prefer that our products are designed to address the specific use cases, like I said. Finally, a comment on our EBITDA performance. 
comparing the underlying EBITDAs of Q2 and Q3 shows a 0.6% uh, point uh, increase in EBITDA over Q2. In Q2, we had a one-off benefit of the cumulative growth step and MEI for previous quarters. So the underlying EBITDA as per our calculation was actually 15%. Now, this quarter we've delivered 156 the improvement is accounted for evenly by an improved realization of the U.S. dollar and price increases in the quarter slightly ahead of the final cost increases which were experienced. All operating costs were tightly controlled. The outlook on cost increases is a very gentle 1% or so at this point of time in quarter four, and this has already been passed on by the increases in early chat. Thank you very much, everybody, for patiently listening in, and we can now open the floor for Q&A. Thank you very much. We will now begin the question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and one on the touchstone telephone. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star and two. Participants are requested to use handsets while asking a question. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. A reminder to the participants, please limit your questions to two per participant. Should you have any follow-up, may be requested to rejoin the queue. The first question is from the line of Raghunandan NL, NL from NK Global. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you, sir, for the opportunity and thank you for the comprehensive opening remarks. Uh, my first question was uh, uh, company's thought process for electric three-wheeler uh, has been to provide an ecosystem for operators and not only a product. What all would an ecosystem include? Also, competitors are focusing on battery swapping model as well. Would Bajaj also focus on a swapping option? So, um the three-wheeler uh, development is now uh, nearing its final phase, and we expect to be putting up the three-wheelers for approvals by end of this fiscal, and then in the next quarter, we will launch them. We, would, we will have a comprehensive range which covers uh, uh, progressively the cargo, the small passenger, and the large passenger. We will be trying to uh, use, uh, we will be using our current brand name and trying to uh, throw over the enormous equity which we enjoy with mechanics and uh, drivers and fleet owners into the uh, electric side as well. We are gearing up our uh, dealer network to, uh, to uh, you know, provide all the uh, support services. And these three wheelers will come equipped with telematics, etc which will allow fleet owners a better uh, sort of uh, ability to manage uh, their fleet and utilization of the cargo uh, vehicles. Uh, this is what it is uh, uh, right now. And uh, what was the battery swapping? Yeah, the battery swapping part. Uh, these three wheelers uh, could, at this point of time, with the kind of numbers which are going to be in the field, uh, in three wheelers, we feel that the battery swapping uh, approach is going to drive up the capex because till the time the park number doesn't cross a critical size, you need to have twice the number of batteries in the system as there are vehicles. Only then the customer will be able to get the batteries as and when they want. At the current cost of the batteries. Having 2x number of batteries for each vehicle, uh, one on the vehicle and one somewhere in the system, uh, will drive up the capex of the system. It will matter who pays for it, but it will be recovered in one way or the other, as interest, etc., or use charge, or whatever. So, till the time this doesn't uh, cross that critical number, where the uh, x factor comes down to 1.2x or so, like it is, let's say, for a two-wheeler in Taiwan, uh, or the battery costs plummet strongly, it doesn't make sense in the three-wheeler segment, which is a commercial segment, to have a swappable approach. However, from a technology point of view, 
we are investing behind this and we will have a range of two wheelers which will uh, work on battery swapping and we will see if we can do this through our dealers and other methods this will allow us to have a leg in the technology space and depending on the commercial viability of this approach we will play it out in uh, whether it is three wheelers or two wheelers thank you sir uh my second question was can you give some color on upcoming products in uh, evs and ics uh, in evs there are spy shots seen in media reports for electric scooter there is also hope that electric motorcycles will come up ahead in collaboration with ktm and also if you can uh, highlight uh, the bajaj triumph combined efforts for premium ic motorcycles so uh most of our r&d effort in terms of new platform is now focused on ev we are focusing only on one platform which is a new platform in the ice range which will hopefully expand uh, and really uh, bring a very differentiated proposition in the uh, commuter segment in due course of time apart from that all the new platform building is now taking place in the electric side of things in that we are uh, we feel that the traditional ways of segmentation are not relevant in uh, electric uh, two wheeler segment at least which was you know we were looking at commuters we were looking at uh, mid range and then we were looking at sporty commuters and like that but uh, you ways of segmentation are needed which are based more on people's preference for which are more on usage case you know uh, one may prefer speed somebody else may prefer range uh, somebody else may prefer convenience of charging etc so we are lo- looking at these use cases and our objective is through these platforms um, and i say there are at least three platforms in the uh, in the r&d which are right now being uh, conjured up tech to cover uh, most of the use cases and as and when we understand the use cases emerging we will deploy the uh, appropriate and the relevant platform it is not possible to imagine all the use cases immediately therefore we have looked at uh, taking a platform approach which will allow us to spring into Uh, uh development of uh, uh to address a specific use case i mean there to give you illustration it could be there could be obvious uh, the emergence of the delivery segment is obvious but within the delivery segment there could be uh, a sub segment which prefers low speed which is uh, which doesn't require licensing and there could be some uh, sub segment which actually uh, prefers high speed and long range and both these require individually different and customized solutions so therefore our approach is to uh, build together uh, build these platform which will allow us to address these uh, new segments uh, over a period of time we, we are collaborating with um, uh, ktn uh, they uh, you know some the electric style power train is actually very very suitable for some of the extreme sport motorcycles um we are looking at uh, those they may not find too much of an application in india but they again give us a lot of manufacturing and development experience and you know access to uh, global markets through the ktm brand or through the uh, bajaj brand so that work is going on we are also looking at different forms not just motorcycles but suffice it to say that beyond motorcycles and uh, scooters different forms are being evaluated uh, some of them are already in play uh, you can go to the ktm website and have a look but we are jointly evaluating uh, different forms and if they are applicable in india we will uh, present them in india or we will present them in uh, some other overseas markets with julu we are getting very valuable information on how last mile and first mile requirements are there how the low speed delivery segment is shaping up and we are working with them to develop 
uh, buy and develop a vehicle specifically to address this, and you will uh, most likely it will be presented uh, within uh, 2022. So there will be a lot of activities. I think for, uh, uh, it will first start with the aggressive rollout now of Chetak. Progressively, I think uh, we are seeing a better and better supply chain visibility. So we'll, so quarter four will be much better than quarter three, and quarter one will be much better than, uh, than quarter four. We will roll this out. That's our first priority. And then progressively, the Chetak platform will be expanded, the KTM-based platform will be expanded, and the Zulu-based platform will be expanded. The next question is from the line of Gunjan Prithiani from Bank of America. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks, uh, team, for <clears throat> taking my question. Um, it's it's really good to hear more about electric uh, and you know hear your thought process. I, I just uh, you know on this topic, you've mentioned uh, you know many times in past that supply chain has been a constraint. I'm I mean I'm just trying to understand if you know you can give us more color on what are really the problem areas. Is it chips? Is it battery? And what are we doing to address that? Uh, because we may have a half a million capacity coming on stream mid-year. I mean, is it something that we are doing on the back end that this capacity can be, can be ramped up when the demand, you know, you know, when the EV transition accelerates? So, you know, the first question on the supply side. So, uh, we had a lot of trouble uh, last year once the, uh, uh, you see, uh, we started in let's say April, May, June, uh, March, April, May of 2020, and then the and COVID uh, struck us, and our arrangements which we had put in place, uh, I don't want to name the vendors, but global vendors, very uh, reputed companies, uh, those arrangements collapsed between those companies and their suppliers. As a result of which, there was a blowback on us, and our arrangements uh, got impaired. And these are primarily in the uh, battery side. Uh, and later on, because of the independent issue of the semiconductors uh, coming on, we faced a double value of some of the electronic components uh, getting into a problem. We, over the last six to nine months, what we have done is we have indigenized uh, and we have internalized a lot of the uh, components. And uh, we have put in new supply chain arrangements, which have fallen in place, and we will start to see that impact. We have also got, uh, you know, the in-house uh, technology-based uh, Chetak uh, approved by ARAI, by FAME, and all that. And that has started to roll out in the, into the uh, market since uh, end of uh, December, and now, of course, it is in full flow. Because of this, uh, because of this, uh, uh, I mean, debacle is a strong word, but because of this problem which we faced uh, with our previous uh, arrangements and the configurations are based on those arrangements, it took time to change into a new configuration and put the new arrangement. Those have now been put in place, and we see that um, uh, uh, we see a better visibility because of that. Having said all this, I must point out that the supply chain environment for everyone does remain uncertain because the chip situation, uh, we are now realizing again that there is a, uh, you know, there is a little bit of turbulence uh, in that area once again. Uh, so we remain vulnerable as everyone does, but our specific problem, which was a base, our whole configuration was over-reliant on one vendor system, that we have at least been able to uh, neutralize. Okay, okay, that's that's good to hear. The second question again I had on the three-wheeler business. Now, I mean, I do understand, you know, CNG and, uh, you know, we are gaining share in cargo, but this is something that, you know, this is again a sector, a segment which is very, very vulnerable to a uh, e-transition. Now, uh, you know, you did mention we'll roll out the products, but there is also lot of new competition which is coming in this space so maybe you know if you can give us your perspective as to do you see this segment shifting very quickly to electric and if not you know what are what are the real challenges because you all have been speaking about cng a lot more than electric in three wheelers yeah first of all i think that the cng is a very very good option when it comes to 
uh, you know, uh, environment and uh, operating cost. It is a product which the mechanics and the drivers really understand well. CNG network is something which the government is very, very keenly, I mean, you just have to go into the, uh, the company's sites and see, not our company, but the government sites and see how aggressively the uh, government has been rolling out. And, and uh, you know, I'm surprised that the media doesn't pick it up, but it is one of those infrastructure projects which over the last two years has been very successfully uh, implemented. And even this year, like I said, the number of towns and coverage is really increasing. And the moment the CNG comes, you can see uh, very, it's very clear that people really prefer uh, going to CNG because it gives a huge improvement over the current uh, operating uh, cost over diesel or petrol. And um, that's why we support it. And we have always supported it. And we have always we have found that even internationally, wherever CNG is there, it has made a good impact. And why should we not pursue an alternate fuel? Because in any case, at a, at a macro level, what we believe is that the two issues of environment and dependency on the dollar, which the government is trying to uh, mitigate through transition into electric, is going to be served better if we sort of move into different alternate fuels and even things like flex fuels, ethanol-based fuels, etc. It's I don't think just the move from uh, petrol to uh, electric is going to fully serve those twin objectives. So we are very keen. We are not going to abandon um, our pursuit and our expertise and our authority on alternate fuels uh, just because electric is there. We are going to pursue, continue to pursue that, and we'll pursue electric. Now, on the electric side, the issue is that the Whereas when it comes to operating costs, certain, uh, compared to CNG, an electric vehicle is about 10% cheaper. Compared to LPG, it's about 20% cheaper. And compared to uh, diesel, it's about 30% cheaper, the operating cost. But capital costs are higher, and therefore there has to be a very strong retail finance support. In today's environment, uh, stepping up retail finance beyond what it is already doing, you know, is a bit of a tall order. And it will still take some stabilization of the environment for retail finance companies to come in and, and say that we are going to now support purchase of a very expensive electric three-wheeler when the demand environment is peak. So that is one constraint. But we'll keep working on that. We have BFL with us and we are constantly exploring opportunities there. The second is, of course, the, the uh, charging anxiety. We will leverage our uh, distribution network, and we will see how the uh, charging anxiety uh, can be addressed. It takes three to four hours, and parking where you can charge uh, is an issue. These kind of things are there in the minds of uh, people. So things may uh, unfold faster in fleet owners and cargo and small um, multi-load operators and those kind of segments. But the vast market, which comprises, you know, individual uh, owners running the three-wheeler is an issue. And the final point in an individual driver owner's mind is that what will happen to the battery? What will happen to the resale value? Hey, he knows is very, very clear when he buys a three-wheeler, what he will be able to sell it off at the end of three years, five years, seven years. It's a mature resale market. The electric three-wheeler market is not a mature one. And the retail price understanding is an important component in the purchase decision of an individual driver owner. But these will also get resolved over a period of time. So therefore, we feel but it's not that the transition will be dramatic and sudden. It is definitely on us, but it will unfold progressively as these things, these chips fall in place, and they will take some time to fall in place. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Kapil Singh from Namura. Please go ahead. Sir, I wanted some color on the export market, please. Uh... Also, if you could cover, uh, you know, things like uh, plans which have taken place 
in uh, markets like Egypt on three wheelers. And also a little bit of contrast uh, in comparison to the Indian market because we have seen these, uh, you know, waves in export markets also. But, uh, you know, the volumes there have been doing pretty well. So, uh, you know, just some contrast as to what is going right in those markets uh, compared to India in your view. And also, of course, the uh, volume outlook, whether we can sustain the current run rate. That, that's the first question. Okay. So, yeah, the, uh, I mean, over the last few years, the outside world sees a very steady uh, volume uh, in exports of uh, three-wheeler. But what is happening underlying this is a furious pace of uh, business development. Now, in India being a mature, mature market, the scope for business development only comes when there is a discontinuity like we just talked about one, which is the advent of the three, uh, CNG three-wheeler, or one which will come up to, um, uh, let's say, in a few months or quarters, which is the electric side, which I hopefully we will be able to cannibalize the e rigs which are all these China-based uh, cruddy stuff which comes. Now, uh, in the exports, we got a lot of learning when suddenly we lost out of our 22, 23,000 units per month, which we used to do, we used to do 10,000 units uh, in Sri Lanka. This is six, seven years ago. And when suddenly that thing got switched off because the Sri Lankan government came down on the uh, three wheeler because of uh, import bills, etc. And we were suddenly faced with a crashing three wheeler uh, export sales. And we launched a furious development uh, exercise at that point of time. And uh, over the last four or five years, we have developed something like 23 or 26 brand new three-wheeler markets. Those, these countries like Iraq, Philippines, had never ever seen a three-wheeler. But our teams went out over there, educated, trained, supported, uh, trialed, and expanded the three-wheeler market. So today, uh, as the, before the lockdown and now that market is coming back, we are doing over 2,000, almost 2,000 units in, of three-wheeler in Philippines. Cambodia had never seen a three-wheeler. And we, are, uh, we, are, we were doing 1,800 units in Cambodia per month. Iraq, we are touching 3,000 3, units uh, per month. It, it had never ever seen a three-wheeler in its, uh, you know. And in the early days, we have developed Mexico, then uh, Dominican Republic, and I can continue. There are many, many markets. So we are continuing this uh, learning from that. There is a constant, there is a squad in the exports team whose constant mission is to uh, develop three wheelers, and now we are looking at electric three wheelers very uh, aggressively. And uh, the development of the, uh, we are looking at that as an opportunity. So uh, our when we look at what is in the pipeline, we believe that there will be the constituents in terms of the countries will vary, but we think we will be able to sustain, if not improve marginally, this level of performance in export of three wheelers. Egypt uh, banned the three wheeler in uh, October, but you would have seen in November, December, and well into quarter four, we will continue our export at the same level to Egypt because the Egyptian government quite uh, supportively has, uh, has uh, allowed existing orders. So that's why the pace of export is uh, continuing. And while that is happening, we are in dialogue through our partners there with the Egyptian government, because the Egyptian government has a requirement of CNG. They want to shift to uh, CNG, and till now we've been only exporting gasoline. We are in discussion uh, to them offering the CNG option. They're also in some parts of the city, they want a higher speed vehicle, a better looking vehicle, etc. And we are in uh, discussion with them. And hopefully over the next couple of months, we will be able to uh, resolve a few things. Because I must also say that there are many uh, territories within Egypt as it is within many countries, including places like Mexico, 
where there is no other way. A bus cannot go, a minibus cannot go, a car cannot go into those narrow uh, towns or in Lima, you know, in the favelas, etc. When a bus drops off a customer, a passenger, the passenger has to uh, walk uphill for another uh, two to three kilometers to reach his home through winding streets. And that is where only a three-wheeler can uh, uh, take, you know, and if there is a woman who's come with some shopping, etc., there is only, these are the kind of people we are uh, uh, serving. And uh, so, you know, it's not easy also to shut off this type of public transport without uh, inconvenien inconveniencing uh, the customers. So, uh, through the twin, the thing of engaging with the government, and secondly, furious pace of and continuous business development, we hope to sustain this level of performance in three-wheeler exports. Uh, and uh, sir, two-wheelers? Sorry? For, uh, for two-wheeler export outlook? Two-wheeler export outlook. The two-wheeler export outlook, sorry, your audio was not very clear to me. Yeah, the two-wheeler export outlook uh, in the short term, which is quarter four, is uh, will remain steady. But, you know, what happens is that the year comes to a close uh, and there is some spillover which goes into April, May. So to that extent, uh, we will see uh, some uh, reduction. Last year, we were building up stock. But at the retail level, it's all going very strong. And uh, we are hoping to um, conclude the financial year with 2.5 million plus of exports, uh, almost $2.3 billion, and a very good uh, surge in culture and uh, dominance. And this gives us a great momentum, and the stocks are not very high. This gives us a great momentum of entry into uh, financial year 23-24, 22-23, I mean. Okay. And so second question was on electric. Uh, we've seen these bookings coming for Chetak and, uh, you know, we we are operating at a certain price point. So I just wanted to understand when you when we are looking at these customers, you know, who are these customers? Are they people who are using a current 100 or 125cc scooter or these are some enthusiasts who are uh, testing out the product at this price point? Uh, the reason to ask this question is also because we are now putting up a 5 lakh capacity so I just want to understand where, whether there is that much demand at this price point or you need to straddle a much bigger price range, uh, uh, you know, let's say from 100,000 or 80,000 onwards, so if, if you can give some color on that as well. Yeah, sure. See, uh, first of all, you should understand, uh, despite all the media frenzy, let's keep our nose on the ground and see that today the penetration of uh, the two-wheeler, uh, electric two-wheeler is only 1% of the, uh, I mean, it's only 2% of the uh, overall two-wheeler market. So that is the play right now. Now, within that, of course, if that has to expand to 4%, 8%, 10%, 15%, it will have to cover a very different uh, level of price points. There is no escaping from that. But staying within the... Um, uh, current uh, price point also there are opportunities which are more geographic in nature. What we have achieved till now is only on the basis of eight cities. And we want to, uh, the more we expand, we will be able to take the top of the uh, pyramid in all these cities. But for it to truly replace the two, uh, two wheel, uh, ICE, we will have to go into uh, different price points. Secondly, even examining who are the people that you ask, who are the people who are buying it, the heartening thing is that there is a wide cross-section. I mean, to give you some color, uh, if I look at Pune, which has got most uh, high level of uh, electric penetration, and this is where we launched our electric uh, Cheta uh, first, and it's a market where we've got most data, because we've been operating it now for almost one and a half years. So, our sales from our showroom uh, or dealer in the center of the city are far outtipped by sales from our dealers on the outskirts, let's say like in Chakram and adjoining areas of Pune. What I'm saying is that people, uh, you would expect 
maybe someone who is environmentally conscious, economically uh, uh, stronger, very urban kind of a persona to be the first buyer. But what we are finding is that that person is there, but we are also finding is that there are people who are, uh, you know, in suburban areas who are very attracted to the proposition of meaning. When we are looking at the language which people are preferring to choose, because now Chetak is, can be bought online, they're choosing vernacular language more over English, which suggests a certain socio-economic class. We would expect people like uh, to use English, but no, the vernacular language is being used. You can see today, if you're just driving around in Pune, you can see women, you can see elderly men, you can see delivery boys in the morning coming and dropping newspaper on a chetan. It does, it is very, very uh, heartwarming, therefore, to see at one level that electric as a concept is getting wide-ranging acceptance, and chetan as a brand is also getting wide-ranging acceptance. But for it to reach a meaningful penetration and not be a, all this is happening within this 2% big one is talking about. But yes, going forward, one will have to obviously make it more accessible to uh, a different income demographic. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Binay Singh from Morgan Stanley. Please go ahead. Uh, hi, team. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, I had two questions. Firstly, on the margin side, you know, good to hear that you've taken around a 5% price hike on the export front. So from here on, how do you see the margin trajectory for the business? Uh, the margins have uh, expanded sequentially, but still sharply down on a YOY basis. So what's the outlook on that? That's the first question. So, Vinay, uh, let me uh, invite uh, your old friend, Kevin Dissa, uh, who is officiating after, as the CFO after so many parties. Let me uh, invite him to uh, talk about it. Uh, hi, Vinay. Good to hear from you. Yeah. Uh, likewise, Kevin. Good to hear from you. Vinay, uh, what I see from the margin point of view is you have seen a sequential improvement from 15 to 15.6. And actually, I go back a little bit, and if you see the margin was just at about 19.8 in quarter 3, Nearly got affected significantly by the high cost increase in materials, which, given the situation of demand and given the situation of the uh, situation, we really couldn't pass on the entire cost. So I'm happy to inform you that in quarter three, the entire cost has been passed on, and as a result of which, margin improvement has been reflected with the material cost coming down by about 0.4%. In Q4, as Rakesh has mentioned earlier, we have estimated a bit of cost increase that we've come in. Primarily, the cost increase are in areas of steel, zinc, and uh, uh, lead. There's a reduction in other metals like rhodium, etc. Cost increase that is there is not going to be too severe, but all that has been passed on to the customer. Now, given the volume increase and a slight appreciation in the dollar that we hope to get, I think there should be a marginal improvement in the margins as we see from here. But this is at this particular point of time we're taking the call. But it will be stable, and I very frankly say that will be plus or minus 0.3.5% from what we see today. Uh, great, and great. Thanks for that, Kevin. And the second question is, you know, when we look at standalone minus console, which probably is coming from KTM, we see a lot of volatility in that number. It was around, uh, I, I think, 300 crores in last quarter, uh, in the September quarter, 140 crores in this quarter. So could you talk a little bit about uh, that, how to see this run rate going ahead? Uh, which is this, uh, Vinay, please? KTM. Uh, this is a uh, consolidated profit, uh, less standalone profit, uh, taking away the one-offs. You know, this quarter also has a one-off. So, so in a way, I think it's all coming from KTM. So could you comment a little yeah. bit about the KTM profitability? We've seen a little bit volatility in that. Sure. So if I talk of the KTM and the consolidated uh, profits, uh, see, we always take KTM one quarter in areas is the more what we consolidate. 
Now, the first quarter would have been a little bit affected by the COVID. So the operating profit that KTM has shown is on a steady state uh, going forward from the last two quarters. But over the two quarters, two things have happened. One, as we have explained, there has been a bit of the restructuring of our holding in KTM, that is Bajaj Auto Indonesia holding in KTM, which is about 47.99%, got swapped to 47.56% of Piera Bajaj AG. That in quarter two resulted in an exceptional gain of about 502 crores. So that's where the volatility came in in the consolidated. Again, in this quarter, what has happened is we were left with 1.49% of KTM, which was sold in the buyback, resulting in a further gain of about 75 crores. On a, quarter, on a normal operating basis, KTM is showing a very steady uh, profit over the last two quarters. Now, the other thing I'd like to share with you is as of now, like I mentioned, we consolidated one quarter in areas. So what we have consolidated in this quarter is the profit of KTM. As we go into the next quarter, we will be consolidating the quarter of Pura Bajaj, which will be KTM plus uh, the other electric businesses of KTM. So you could see a bit of a bump up there as well in quarter four. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Chirag Shah from Edelweiss. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, sir, first question is on uh, on the three-wheeler side. If you can help us understand in domestic as well as exports, the breakup between CNG and other uh, fuel, you know, how much in domestic market would be CNG of the, of the total volume and similarly in exports? My, uh, I think about uh, almost about 60% uh, in domestic is uh, CNG, uh, which is uh, in passenger and in uh, cargo uh, combined. Yeah. Um, exports is much less. I don't have the number, but I can request uh, Anand to uh, give you that precise number. Chirag, I can give you that number after the call. Yeah. So, so secondly, on on the EV side, there were reports around uh, around few months back that uh, Hatskwarna's i line is likely to be manufactured in India, and it was supposed to get launched in calendar year 22. There has been some delay because of a variety of reasons. Should we assume this 500,000 capacity that you have announced also takes into account uh, HQ's two products? Apart from i line, there is one more product that they were looking to launch in uh, CY 22. Hello. Uh, sorry, I didn't. Uh, uh, the audio was not very clear. So uh, you you are talking about Husqvarna, which models? So there were two electric models that they were looking to launch in calendar year 22. Uh, they, they were, they, that was showcased uh, somewhere in April 21 and then updated in September 2021. And the indication was that they would be manufactured by Bajaj in India for global perspective. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. So, uh, uh, you see, that uh, finishing, that, that is going to be on the basis of um, sort of kits which we will supply. Uh, uh, and uh, that exactly how they are going to do it, that KTM and Haskarna will deal with. This plant no. is not for, from that point of view. But over a period of time, I'm not ruling out that uh, I'm not saying that we will not make any Urquhart or KTM electric over here. That depends on how it unfolds. But currently, what was discussed and what was uh, what we had briefly talked about, that KTM is making uh, on its own based on certain sharing of platform uh, with Bajaj. Okay, so this the plan that we are that we have announced is excluding this development. So as and when this development takes shape, there could be further additions that could happen on the product side. That's that's right. This is more to serve uh, the requirements of Chetak uh, portfolio. Uh, in that, if something can be is needed, needs to be accommodated, we will see at that point. But it is being configured for the Chetak portfolio only. Okay. And so just a uh, follow-up question on Chetak uh, and the EV product expansion that you indicated. Chetak is a very uniquely designed product. Uh, you know, uh, let me use a slightly more uh, nostalgia kind of a kind of a design, you know, going back back to the history. 
something like say royal enfield in in the motorcycle space uh, do you think that there is a need for a slightly uh, differential designing also to expand the ev portfolio of uh, bajaj or chetak type of designing is the best design that you are working with so uh, our objective is to we are seeing this as a white canvas and we don't want to paint a certain box of for the chetak brand and then become prisoners of it because a very high level of marketing efficiencies can be achieved if we follow uh, the harbon uh, harmonized approach of having the same name of the company the same name on the store and the same name on the uh, product uh, this allows a lot of marketing efficiencies and a very focused and strong integrated brand development now in this the downside could be that can one brand fit various uh, form factors and sizes and that's the opportunity we have with cheta we if if we take a very narrow view of it and say that okay cheta is only you know that kind of a form then uh, we become a prisoner of it as some other companies have become and we don't want to do that we want to uh, garner the marketing efficiency and you know the more vehicles are on the road the more different types of vehicles are on the road the brand only gets uh, reinforced in the mind of the consumer because uh, you know having multiple brands also causes choices uh, causes uh, cognitive uh, confusion in the con- consumer's mind so we are uh, going to uh, expand uh, the chetak portfolio keeping the basic essences of uh, chetak right so that people should be able to see elements they should not look like you know a zoo where there is a zebra and an elephant and a giraffe and all put together in under one brand not like that but the whole skill of the r&d will be to for people to be able to um, uh, uh, take benefit from different form factors and different styles but still see the unifying thread of the design in them and that is what we are working for i mean obviously i cannot show you but the uh, that is a kind of work which is now under way and uh, people in r&d and uh, marketing are sitting together and saying that yes when you put the entire mix together does it look you know as it belong coming from the same parent or not so we would go towards uh, having different form factors and different styles under the chetak name Thank you. The next question is from the line of Nitish Mangal from Jeffries. Please go ahead. Hi, good morning. Thanks for taking my questions. Uh, uh, Rakesh, you made an interesting comment on how segmentation in EVs might be uh, might have to be seen differently versus the IC. In context of that, how do you see a typical uh, sports motorcycle uh, customer today thinking about uh, EV options? I mean, is it possible that uh, a typical customer there might look at scooter as a form form factor so can that transition happen in uh, a meaningful way thanks in motorcycle for motorcycle scooter people moving from sport factors yeah look at so see in the sport motorcycle in the see in any case a motorcycle allows uh, much less space to the uh, designer to work with the battery system and the more dense uh, battery is which means less space it needs then there are issues around um, uh, heat generation uh, when it uh, uh, sort of discharges or when it charges then how do you dissipate uh, the heat and secondly of course the cost of more intensely packed uh, batteries because the space available uh, in a motorcycle uh, is less but having said that so therefore you cannot have a very all pervasive unless there is a change in technology but assuming we stay with the current technology because there is a lot of technical development taking place in the battery systems also but keeping that aside now but there are certain there are certain sports uh, bikes like for example enduro or off roader which need uh, where electric is very well suited because it need very high levels of torque and the need you know the ability to go from 0 to 60 kilometers per hour in a matter of seconds and that an electric
electric motor can serve much better than a ICE uh, based system. So in those uh, extreme sport areas, I think the transition to electric. And secondly, what happens is when you're using it for sport, uh, uh, it is imaginable that a person may not be too worried about range. These sports of off-roading, enduro, motocross, they take place in confined uh, arenas. And they're not like touring or things like that. So uh, there are segments of the sports vehicles which will see transition to electric. Uh, and uh, that may happen. But in general, uh, motorcycles, because of the reasons I described faster in the commuter, high-end commuter or low-end commuter, will take still take uh, some more time before, you know, uh, people move, before they move to electric. Yes, and whether a commuter motorbike owner will start to uh, prefer a, a electric, certainly that possibility is there. It is not necessary that the uh, electric scooter will cannibalize only ICE scooter. They will cannibalize uh, commuter motorcycles also. Ultimately, uh, the entire commuting, whether it's scooter or uh, motorcycle, but the entire commuter IC market is open for cannibalization by electric. And so, so it's, it's a bit uh, you know, possible to assume that uh, as uh, the market moves from IC to EV, the share of scooters might uh, actually rise because that's the, seg uh, the form factor which is easier to have an EV. Yeah, you can say if you put together the EV and the IC that there is a chance that um, uh, the scooter market uh, will rise. And that is actually the most attractive part for Bajaj Auto. If you see, this is a point which I have not mentioned in my opening remarks, I should have. But it is opening up a vast new segment for us. I mean, for uh, reasons which are well known, we have stayed away from the scooter market. But uh, because the cannibalization will be faster in scooters, because when it there are two things. One is the form factor, and the second is the powertrain. And the powertrain has uh, uh, implications of cost, etc. The scooter, the guy who is, uh, or the lady who is preferring a scooter has already overcome the decision of the form factor. That means they've already said, Ki bhai, main, I'll not take a motorcycle, I'll choose a uh, scooter. And now the second decision is uh, whether uh, uh, powertrain should be EV or powertrain should be ICE. So, therefore, the cannibalization will be faster in scooters and mm -hmm. slower in the other, which means that vast new segments open up for us in places like India and ASEAN, where there is, we are sort of always hampered because 90% of the market is non-motorcycle over there. And now this gives us an excellent entry uh, into ASEAN and to the Indian scooter market. Uh, Mr. Uh, and one more question on the uh, commodity cost side. I mean, you uh, explained how you're looking at the next quarter uh, quite well. Uh, but uh, when I look at precious uh, metal prices, I mean, those are down uh, very significantly. How much is uh, that as a part of your total RM basket today, and uh, you know, especially rhodium, which was one of the biggest pressure points earlier? Uh, it will. It's uh, not very large compared to the major cost for a motorcycle. For example, the biggest cost drivers will be steel, aluminium, and of course, rubber in the tires, etc. So this is a small part, but the fall over there would help us in the overall uh, benefit on the material cost. It's not very large. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, due to time constraint, we take that as the last question. I now hand the conference over to Mr. Anand Neuer for closing comments. Over to you, sir. Thank you, everyone, for joining the call. I see quite a few participants waiting to ask the questions. So uh, I will be happy to take those calls after 12.30. Uh, and thank you, and stay safe. Thank you, thank everyone. You. Thank you, everybody. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of Bajaj Auto Limited, that concludes this conference. We thank you all for joining us and you may now disconnect your lines.